The first set of presentations is more or less a feedback from the side meetings that were held on Monday. And as we had eight different groups, we merged all the presentation in one big block, one and a half hours. So each group will present the highlights, the identified actions, and also what worked well and what could be improved uh, from their experience of these side meetings. And we start with group one, which is the airline community and I would like to hand over to the colleagues for their presentation. Thanks. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, since the site meeting, first uh, site meeting was airline, we are selected to present the airline site meeting outcomes to you. Uh, my name is Uğur Çelikyay. I am from STM, Turkey. We had a very nice composition of 20 different attendees in the airline site meeting, group one. Uh, 15 of them were really airlines, DOAs, and the rest are the small DOAs which are not airline, but supporting the airlines in minor chains or other STC activities. Out of those 15 airlines, most of them were belongs to European airlines, but Four of them were out of European Union airlines, which have to follow the EASA regulations to keep the aircraft in uh, airworthy condition and for the future life in probably in European or EASA territories. We have a special thanks to uh, EASA DOA team leader, Mr. Uh, Damian Kocjancic, for the moderation, and also uh, the EASA experts, which give us very deep and uh, basic knowledge of the some activities. Our uh, meeting agenda started with the cabin safety aspects, of course, because for the airline, the most uh, important, most popular things, uh, the voice is not. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, of course, started with the cabin safety aspects. Our senior uh, cabin safety expert of EASA, Mr. Thomas Omnibus, uh, Omnibus uh, give us very detailed uh, information about the upcoming issues, MPAs, and cabin safety, uh, new uh, introduction of the cabin safety items. Started with the MPA 2013-20, which is the emergency landing dynamic conditions, which affects the airlines, which will affect the airline in the future, and of course the industry. Uh, it's not a change on CS25, but change on CS26, which uh, will not change the type certification data sheet or type certification of the uh, existing aircraft, but after two weeks of uh, time, it will be voted in the European uh, Union Parliament and then take into the force within two years of transition period, means by 2021, in let's say second quarter of the 2021, none of the uh, large aircraft will be uh, manufactured with nine GCs, with static uh, emergency landing conditions, but instead they will all shall fully compliant with 25562, which is emergency dynamic conditions. How does it affect the existing fleets? In a time being, uh, they will only have the dynamic condition seats available, I mean, uh, operatable in the European Union boundaries. And the other uh, issues were related with the build of seat parts other than the cushions, which was another important subject for the STCs, for the uh, seat manufacturers, and approval of the in-flight crew rest compartments, the change on the uh, in-flight crew rest compartments. Those, are, those were the main cabin safety items we have discussed. And then 
we go through the additive manufacturing uh, topics, which is also important for the airlines because lots of the uh, STCs and chains for airlines, we will use additive manufacturing or 3D uh, printing in very soon. The highlights are given by a uh, structure expert uh, and additive manufacturing focal point, Mr. Wolfgang Hoffmann to us, and the principles of the additive manufacturing and the certification aspects are explained to us. It was also interesting. Another uh, subject for the uh, first group of airline meeting was change implementation. We have discussed about the repair interface with STC modified aircraft because we have some real problems with the uh, uh, STC applied aircraft against the, in case of uh, damage, who will be responsible for the certain areas. There are some gray areas and it's, it's, it has a burden for airline to not to have answer from the type certificate holder because of the STCs. And also uh, unrepaired damage versus flight conditions and permit to fly approval also have been discussed in between us. Those were the main uh, change implementation subject we have discussed in our site meeting. And I would like to give the uh, for Dilek. Okay, my name is Dilek. Uh, I'm working for Etihad Airways Engineering. Uh, in the afternoon, we started to discuss operational suitability data. Uh, as the poll, I mean the voting results shown yesterday, um, it is a bit tricky for all design organizations to do the impact assessment or the classification for the OSD constituents. I mean, uh, we had the opportunity to discuss the OSD yesterday with Andrea Boyardi, chief expert of OSD. And um, we will discuss the OSD again in the afternoon. I will not go into details, but uh, we, have, we have identified some peculiar cases where we have a minor change, but we might have an impact on the cabin crew data, or even we were questioning if we have any impact on simulator data. And the lack of simulator data, we were not sure if we have an impact on that constituent or not. Uh, we need some more guidance material from EASA to do that assessment. And if we have minor modification, we, we should only question the impact on the MMEL indeed. But I mean, we have discussed some peculiar cases where MMEL is approved by EASA or not approved by EASA and who is the type certificate holder and the state of the registry, we might have some difficulties to identify the impact. And what was decided, we will approach to EASA for the clarification if we have any struggle in impact assessment or the classification. And later, we discussed a little bit the Brexit. I don't want to make any comment. So as a also, we know the discussion. And thank you. Um, OK, uh, as I said, we need more guidance from EASA on the OSD. And uh, regarding the change implementation, as Mr. Ugur already um, summarized the discussion, uh, we need some support from the TC holders. When we have an STC on the aircraft, like installation of an antenna, um, if there is a repair requirement in a close-by area, uh, we might not be supported by the TC holder because of the STC implementation. We are struggling to get the repair solution from the TC holder and we have to search another design organization to provide a repair. And what we identified in the repair instructions we are receiving from type certificate holders, we don't get the weight and balance change information, but our performance engineering department needs that data to calculate the last configuration, latest configuration of the aircraft in terms of weight and balance. 
What did work well? I mean, we really appreciate EASA to give the, this opportunity to all airline members because we are sharing the same problems. It was a good discussion, fruitful discussions we had yesterday. And I would like to thank all the attendees from airline side especially uh, for open discussions um, and the contributions. Because when we discuss a problem, maybe one of the attendees, one of the airline has that problem today. It will be sure it will be a problem for the other airline next day in the future. And, um, and all the discussions were relevant to airlines. I mean, yes, we are speaking the same language during the side meeting. It was a good opportunity to meet um, subject panel experts and discuss our common problems. And uh, it was a head up for us for upcoming regulations regarding the flammability and crashworthiness requirements to be implemented soon. Um, what did not work well, I mean, we realized for the last couple of uh, workshops, side meetings, we were struggling to find a presenter. We always decided to select presenter at the end of the day. It was too late for the presenters as well. And we decided next time to select the presenter at the beginning of today so that that person or these people will be able to take additional notes. This is like a self-criticism for us. And uh, we would appreciate if EASA can provide the agenda a couple of days earlier, not on the last day. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation and the feedback. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. It sounded more like a challenge cup that you had to run to select the presenter and no, uh, actually, but it's better to be prepared in advance. Yes. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thanks a lot. The next group is the second group working on general aviation, which was moderated by Dirk Krappel and Claudio. I don't know exactly who the presenters are. Oh, there's one, okay. I hope you were selected at the beginning of the meeting. Yes, indeed. All the work points that didn't work with the airline group were pretty well organized from us. We had an agenda and we selected the speaker at the beginning. So, yes, um, I hope everyone understands me well. So, my name is Christian Sturm. I am the chief of the Office of Airworthiness for Graub Aircraft and um, I volunteer to tell you something about the site meeting from General Aviation. Um, the main points of discussion were the CS23 Amendment 5, which is um, for us personally and the company um, the biggest issue. Then qualification of non-critical equipment, AML STC, the management of concessions for the issuance of a certificate of conformity for a prototype, and finally the implementation of electric propulsion to the current regulation. Um, for CS23 Amendment 5, um, the biggest challenge for us is um, that we need a more detailed AMC that better identifies um, each requirement and um, breaks it down to um, the individual um, subsections of the um, ASTM standards. It works better with um, Amendment 4 as some um, AMC, but with the ASTM standards it's still a lot of work. Um, then we had a question about um, how the compliance statement um, is linked to the ASTM or AMC in general. So that now needs to be a little more detailed than it was before and um, there is a little more effort in the compliance statement itself. Um, then we spoke about the new um, 2500 requirements which were the former 1300s. 
um, about um, the requirements for required and not required systems and equipment. And then finally, um, after we complained enough, uh, we were told that a new AMC is in progress to better describe the relation between requirements and the ASTM. So this is all we wanted. Um, then qualification of non-critical equipment. Um, there's a rulemaking um, process going on in part 21 to define a proportional policy for the issuance of EASA form one based on the criticality of each part. And um, you can find details there in NPA 2017-19. Um, then we have also the uh, CMAS 007 for the acceptance of EFIS that has no equipment approval um, or ETSO in small aeroplanes. Um, here also a uh, keyword is the net safety benefit approach. And um, that uh, CMA 007 is basically limited to ELA-1 aircraft, but uh, that, that um, strict limitation to um, ELA-1 seems to be softened. So you can use it for even for other aircraft. And then we found a best practice to perform a failure mode effect and criticality analysis. And um, the failure consequence that comes out here on aircraft level determine the qualification efforts for the individual equipment parts. Then AML STC. Um, the Garmin STC can be used as a guideline to build up future cases. Um, then in some cases, minor changes are uh, uh, required for an installation to a particular aircraft because pins and connectors might be differently assigned or something like this. So there's always a little bit of work. Um, then we spoke about uh, CM21AE. The approved model list changes gives further guidance to the topic. And also this is written for um, large aeroplanes. The basic philosophy can be used also in GA. And in that CM21 AE, there's a template in the attachment for the approved model list. A point to consider is the certification basis of an STC has to cover the different type certification basis of the models contained in the AML. So um, sometimes just taking um, the latest or the newest um, type certification basis seems not enough as um, older versions might have other requirements also, you need to consider that. Um, and then we spoke about the challenges to take um, OSD into, OSD impact into the consideration for uh, all models listed. <clears throat> However, if for the original model no OSD is defined in the TCDS, you don't need to consider it um, in your approved model list. Then implementation of electric propulsion to current regulation. Um, first, there was a general discussion on the crease and on the applicable ASTM um, with the example of some existing projects. A certification basis is currently established on project basis as there is no better um, uh, basis for that. And we briefly spoke about the special condition for EVTOL, which uh, was published last week. I don't know if everybody got that. So that is quite interesting. Actions um, identified. <clears throat> um, one colleague from EASA said that there is too little involvement in the rulemaking process of the European industry in the ASTM standards in the GA world, um, which is true. I have to admit it from my side. And um, the idea was brought up to have a dedicated meeting to foster cooperation among GA industries. And there we are, we are planning a um, kickoff meeting. And now everybody, um, GA OEMs in Europe that don't have the resources to really participate directly in the ASTM meetings are happily invited uh, to join us here and um, to try to make a group that has more influence with um, not too much time effort. 
because at the moment the point is really that uh, the ASTM standards are very um, much driven by the US industry and um, we have a chance to participate here also but at the, cur uh, at the moment we don't use that chance really. Uh, what did work well? Um, <clears throat> the participants from EASA side on the different topics were very well chosen. We had really fruitful discussions, we had um, strong opinions and it was, it was really helpful. In general, the mixture of the, sta of the stakeholders were, was quite well. And was, what was especially good for us, um, there was a survey uh, ahead of um, the meeting to propose topics for the site meeting. And there we could choose what is really important to us and what helps. And we had the speaker um, selected at the beginning and um, I think last week or two weeks ago, we had the agenda. Um, issues encounters, encountered, um, there uh, were no real issues. Um, we have a proposal for next year because um, also for myself, I had to choose between SDC group and GA group. And um, it probably would help to have um, a mixed group STC in small GA and GA product in the same site meeting group next year. But on the other hand, the size of the group was almost perfect. It shouldn't be much bigger. So I don't know what the best solution is. And that was our group. And um, thank you very much. Oh, I, was, I was asked one more point um, to address access to ASTM standards. One colleague said that he uh, purchased each individual ASTM standard, and that is not the way to go. You should um, uh, apply as a company for a membership where you can have access to all ASTM standards, and uh, this is for one year, and this is the way you should do. Don't purchase individual standards. So that's from my point everything. Thanks a lot for the presentation, and I think Thank you very much. Uh, one of the feedbacks for us is better standardize the setup of the meetings and to prepare them. But I think the feedback, at least from the first two groups, is already quite positive in terms of support from EASA, availability of expert, and the setting of the group seems to be the right thing. So that's quite a positive message. Thanks. Thank Good, the next group is on APAS, and they were supported by Pablo and Mariano from, from our side. And I assume the colleague is already on his way, yes. Hello, good morning. I am uh, Andrea Signorini. I am the head of safety and airworthiness of uh, Sistemi Dinamici. Uh, that is a company fully owned by Leonardo Helicopters, uh, who currently has a, a, an application for both uh, uh, certification and uh, DOA for uh, an unmanned helicopter of around 200 kilograms. The points of discussion for the side meeting of, of AirPass were uh, the one that are shown here. So discussion around the categories that has been uh, provided by EASA, so the open, specific, and certified category. Um, then argument around the maximum takeoff weight and the model aircraft of those covered by those categories. Uh, then we discussed around the technical discipline that are expected for uh, Airpass DOA uh, CVs. Uh, and then the discussion was around the certification program and the definition of unsafe condition for, for Airpass. Uh, about the categories, uh, something that you have already heard yesterday by Mr. Natale Di Rubbo, 
Uh, there has been the issue of the opinion of EASA on uh, February of this year. Uh, very uh, in October, early October, there was a dissemination by the European Commission of both the delegated and implementing regulation for covering open and specific categories. And then there are still a few days for industry to provide comments on those draft regulation. Uh, the adoption from the European Commission is expected to happen in the first quarter of 2019. About the certified categories, uh, one message very clear from uh, EASA for all the industry is that uh, Part 21 already allows to certify uh, unmanned aerial systems. So it is possible to apply and to start the process with EASA. Uh, it is expected to have uh, around January of next year uh, expert meetings that would support uh, the issue of the MPA for certified category that is expected to happen as we have seen yesterday in June of next year. And one very important message as has been cited also yesterday is that this will cover everything. So licensing for whatever we want to call the, the crew, uh, it's not flight, but it's a crew, uh, the initial alertiness, the continued alertiness, the operations, and also uh, possible initial changes for the rules of the air. Uh, going to the next steps, then it is expected more or less one year later, the issue of the opinion from EASA uh, and then, uh, with some, of course, usual uncertainties, uh, the phase where there would be dissemination of draft rules by European Commission and then the adoption. Uh, another important message coming from the side meeting is that there are uh, European technical standard orders under discussion for, for two uh, very important and key argument for airports, uh, such as the ground control station and the detect and avoid. The uh, then talking about model aircraft, this was one, one question raised by, by the side meeting participant. Um, so when we talk about model aircraft managed and operated within model clubs and association, uh, this fall into uh, member states regulation with every uh, possible maximum takeoff weight definition that are defined by the member states itself. While, while the operation comes outside of the member or the motor clubs and association, this needs to follow uh, the requirements for the open category uh, issued by, by the European Commission on the base of the opinion of, of EASA. Uh, these are the main top-level requirements for the open category. Uh, so there is a division, as we have seen in detail yesterday, around subcategory, classes, area of operation, maximum takeoff weight, uh, rule of the kinetic energy, the transferred kinetic energy in case of impact. Uh, and those are the basic technical requirements for each of these um, classes and subcategory. Then talking about the certified category, uh, there has been uh, in the new basic regulation uh, uh, at least some top level uh, definition uh, on when uh, any airports would fall into the certified category. So it's very clear that this would be based on a risk assessment for the operation. Uh, so whenever the mitigation uh, that are coming from the risk assessment are not able to fully mitigate the, the, the safety uh, risk, uh, then this will fall, for a specified category, this will fall into the certified one. And for sure, when the, uh, whenever it will happen, there will be transport of people or carriage of dangerous goods, meaning that this will result in risk of third parties in case of accident, of accident or in case of uh, operation over open assembly of people and any dimension above three meters or uh, transferred 
kinetic energy above 34 kilojoules, uh, all these cases will fall into the certified category. Uh, then we pass to the discussion for the CVs for DOA of uh, UAS. Uh, so currently there are no specific, no UAS specific technical discipline in the DOA assessment. Uh, and it was uh, required to, to the industry to start thinking and propose, be propositive to EASA in order to define what could be a specific uh, discipline to UAS. Uh, so one possible argument is the ground control station and the data link that are uh, different from manned aviation, for sure. Uh, then it was discussed the need for having a transversal discipline in order to manage some specificity of, of, of ELPAS, such as the autonomy characteristics, such as the management of the operation, which is something that is very peculiar, because this involves also other uh, part of the of the systems that falls around the the airplane operation, such as the uh, interaction with uh, airspace uh, operators. And it was also underlined the need for having a deep coordination among CVs and disciplines based on the on the same concept. Then we pass discuss, discussing around the certification program, uh, and it was uh, required to have guidance material for the certification program template in order to allow uh, op operators and, uh, and industry uh, to provide their um, certification program with uh, a good level of, of, of understanding. Um, and some specific specificity of, of uh, the certification program were discussed, so it was clear that engine, propeller, operation, and necessity of coordination with navigation service provider may be included in the certification program itself. Um, another important point for, for industry is that uh, the certification program template uh, be, would be issued with easy access rules uh, available. Uh, then the last point of discussion was around the definition of uh, unsafe condition for in-service uh, operation in order to determine uh, what would be the occurrence reporting uh, uh, for in-service. Um, EASA, as we have seen, will issue the MPA in next uh, June. This will also cover uh, the certified category and uh, about the unsafe condition, this would be defined based on the 1309 safety requirement for failure condition that are classified uh, for UAS as catastrophic and hazardous. Um, then another point that was underlined is that in the new basic regulation, there is a requirement of occurrence reporting uh, mandatory for open and specific category in case of any serious or fatal injury to people and uh, uh, any involvement in the event of a manned aircraft. Um, so as, a, as an outcome from, from the meeting, discussing with other colleagues uh, for the industry, uh, it was a reduced number of participants, and this allowed uh, a very good involvement of anyone uh, participating. And there was also a lot of time for an adequate level of explanation and uh, concrete feedbacks from, from the agency. Uh, we consider that the, uh, the roadmap is, is clear and uh, seems on track with respect to what is what was declared in, in the previous years. Uh, it was very good to have uh, this level of dissemination of any rulemaking activities, uh, as well as detailed requirement for open and specific categories that has been issued. Uh, then it was very much appreciated by, by industry that uh, uh, we could have time to have brainstorming of what would be the requirements for certified category 
and there was also uh, a lot of attention on the opinion of the industry uh, of possibility of a, a scaling approach for DOA to be applied to a specific category, which is the one in the middle. Uh, the only possible issue that we identified, apart from, let's say, the, the, uh, the not big participation from the industry side, we were only six participants, uh, is the fact that uh, for whatever current uh, certification or DOA application, it seems that uh, rules that need to be tailored uh, inside of the next MPA uh, can, could slow down the process for, for, for the industry, leading to some uncertainties in the, in the business. And this is the, this is the group underneath. You said it's a small group, but it's quite some attendance, huh? Sorry? You said it's a small group, but it's quite some attendance that you uh, get. Well, it's, it's, if, you, if, you list to the, to, uh, if you look to the list, there is one more participant from EASA than from the industry, so I was saying that. <laughs> but I thought from your feedback that was considered very positive because you had the chance to discuss yeah, yeah, I mean, and get the feedback. Yeah. So I think uh, that shows also the interest on our side on this new topic uh, to get feedback the, uh, from industry and I think that's the, the value the, of the side meeting. Yeah, the feedback around the other participation was, was very, very good. Thanks a lot. Bye. While we are Waiting for the next group, which is the ETSO group. Alain, maybe you, we got one question which is related to the topic from the GA group. Maybe you can uh, explain that group. It's about involvement in standards work. Yeah, we have a question on slide. Good morning, sorry, first. Uh, we have a question on slide though that I'm reading. How can the IASA make sure that the development of standards linked with the other regulation is balanced between the US and Europe. How well is it working? Uh, that's a very relevant question and uh, we have already wondered quite a lot in various uh, brainstorming internal or within industry. But standards are uh, industry developed documents first. We uh, do not have a direct uh, grasp over them. We, of course, we know what's going on and we take full benefit whenever possible, but uh, it is industry initiative. So what we identified as working well for uh, large stakeholders, for large industry, uh, very solid, uh, consolidated, organized industry participation in all kinds of standardization bodies in Europe, of course, but in the US as well, ISTM and so forth. Uh, for GA, is a bit more um, difficult. Uh, and it is back to a comment from the previous uh, site meeting on GA, how best having a European GA industry coordinated approach to regulatory issues in general. And I would extend the question beyond standards. It is also uh, a perception we have for, for rulemaking. When we talk about CS25, CS29, we have very clear uh, industry views and participations and opinions. For GA, it is a, a bit more difficult to get a consolidated input. And therefore, when we want to promote EU industry GA stakeholders' views outside the EU, it is not always that easy. So uh, the question uh, here is very relevant, not only for standards, but for any regulatory tasks. Uh, institutions, be it in Europe or in the US, they really uh, like and even sometimes have to work with, uh, I would not say association, but representative organizations or persons having a mandate to talk on behalf of a group of stakeholders. So the question is very relevant. How can YASA make sure it is not really as a, I would revert the question back to you, in fact. It is how can we together, you industry and us, authority, 
promote common views whenever possible. And it starts with uh, a coordinated industry uh, input, be it technical, regulatory, or uh, negotiation in general, that we could take on board. If we agree, we take it fully. If we disagree, bon, we have to discuss with you, of course, and uh, find a compromise. But if we have different views coming from our own stakeholders, it is extremely difficult to defend uh, a unified, if I may say, position toward external non-EU stakeholders. So I would close uh, my reply by saying, how can I make sure, I would say, how can industry also, starting with industry, make sure we can have a standardized view and then we can work together. But for sure, our GA colleagues and us in general, we really want to make full, to take full credit from standards when we know how they are developed and when we have a certain control on their content, of course. Thank you. Thanks a lot on that. And having, handing now over to the ETSO group, and I would like to thank Oscar and Lex from my team who supported that group and the discussion in there. Thomas, up to you. So, good morning. My name is Thomas Rahm. I am from Hensoldt. Uh, Hensoldt is the former electronics branch from Airbus Defense and Space, for who does not have heard about Hensoldt yet, so we're a rather new company. Um, my task within the company is uh, the DOA, independent monitoring function. Uh, you see here a second name also on the presentation, but Harald dropped out this morning because of health reasons. So I will try to take over also his part. We had uh, three topics in our site meeting on Monday. Uh, the first, or actually it was the second and third, the last one we come to has been our first one. Um, the first topic is um, about ETSO DDP. Uh, it's um, well, best practice topic. Uh, the problem with uh, DDPs is that we have to write DDPs for our ETSO, and a lot of uh, OEMs require additional information, additional signatures, and so on. And so it's always a difficult topic how to handle the DDPs, make several DDPs, or do attachments or do supplements. And we talked about best practice, who is working or which is working with uh, supplements. So the basic DDP, uh, which is agreed with uh, IASA, is the central DDP. And then there are supplements for each OEM, covering only those part numbers and specifics for the OEM. The next topic we talked about was uh, about classification of changes. It was a task we had or an action from two years ago. Um, then it was planned at that time to build up a list uh, with certain changes provided by industry where EASA then should uh, put their comments to it whether this is uh, a minor change, major change, and so on, to make it easier uh, for industry to know in advance which changes would be classified major or minor, even from EASA point of view. Um, after long discussion, we decided that this is not practicable because uh, a lot of things uh, depend on a lot of other things like uh, accumulative effects of multiple changes or the so-called minor-minor changes. So it really depends on the, on the single topic. So it's pretty hard to have a generic list. And that was one of the reasons why we canceled this action. And uh, we called for further guidance, which is already in preparation by IASA to help us when we have to decide about minor or major changes. Last not least, um, it was, I think, the, the major uh, discussion we had in our Monday site meeting 
is about the DOA coming up for ETSO holders. We discussed about the concerns coming from industries uh, concerning the workload, uh, the burden uh, on the workload and uh, the fees. Uh, we talked about considerations, um, how this classification will or could look like. Will it only be the dull level? Will it be other identifications for the complexity uh, of the ETSO? Or could it also be other criteria, like, for example, um, the number of articles, the number of certifications, the size of the company, uh, which could be critical if you consider then uh, what an full-fledged DOA costs the company against what is the cost of the uh, single ETSO article. So the commercial aspect could also be part of the considerations. And uh, we talked about what could be done when we have to go to full-fledged DOA from an ADOP. Um, so to reduce the burden on the industry, on the companies, we thought about uh, possible credits coming from already existing approvals we have, for example, from the military part. Uh, we thought about uh, third party certifications, things like that, which could be considered when you do the uh, surveillance from the other side and do the audits. So. Overall, we identified some topics which uh, should be worked on. So, as I mentioned, uh, further work on the criteria, which define the mandatory DOA for certain ETSO companies. And think about include non-technical criteria. Um, I think it would, or we thought, the group, that it also would be helpful to further clarify potential benefits, especially for companies who do not have a DOA up to now, if they have to go to DOA. For example, uh, they can have a major change approval under certain conditions and things like that, to propagate this also to make it more attractive, even if uh, there is quite a burden on those companies. And um, there could be some possibilities uh, to reduce the burden on the companies and even also on the uh, authorities. Um, when you think about uh, potential cooperations between civil and military authorities who uh, audit the industry against uh, actually the same requirements because uh, the military took over from EASA the same requirements. They audit the same things, the same processes in the same company several times. And uh, even when you have a quality management audit, again, the same processes with basically the same requirements are audited again and again. And so I think there's a big, or we as a group, think there's a big uh, potential for reduction of workload for the authorities and for industry in that part. So we asked EASA to think about those topics. And uh, last but not least, the commercial part. Uh, within the fees, it would be helpful um, to consider when transitioning from APDOA to DOA, uh, the fees and the burden, the financial burden on the companies. So uh, what we considered well and what we appreciated was uh, to have uh, the access to ETSO and DOA expertise from EASA and uh, the very open-minded and fruitful discussion and cooperation we found here during the site meeting but also all the time. So this approach from EASA together with industry really appreciate and thank you for this possibility we had here and actually over the whole year. So this is really a small group. <laughs> uh, 
Um, last year we have been a quite bigger group, at least double the amount. I think it would be a little bit better to have some more colleagues for the next uh, discussions we have. But nevertheless, it's also an advantage to have a small group uh, because also the discussions and the personal involvement of the single person is, uh, I think, a little bit more than if you're in a big group and only two or three are discussing. So, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for the presentation. Welcome. And somehow linked to it after the whole slot of the side meeting feedback, we have after the break a presentation on DOA for ETSO that should address some of the points that uh, were just raised. So the next side meeting group is from the Rotorcraft group, which was supported from Dirk Richard from, from our side. And I see the colleague is already on his way. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Tuomo Jokisalo from Patria Aviation and uh, participated on the Rotocraft side meeting for the first time. And uh, I like to think that I don't represent only Patria here, but also this group. We had 15 people, roughly. And uh, I think quite a fruitful discussion. We tried to keep the presentation short, so we have only only the slides that were given to us and compressed the topics here. We had an industry representative uh, designing quite an interesting product, uh, which is half a car, half a gyroplane, and, and he raised the concern that uh, could there be some proportionality in the gyroplanes and, and could it be considered to be included in the ELA-1 or ELA-2 groups. Then some uh, more discussion was, was raised. I think it interested everyone in the group. The, the frequently asked questions, not just for avionics, but also, also the other frequently asked questions that EASA has kindly published to, to the DOAs. Uh, sometimes there is a misconception whether they are to be followed or, 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 or what is the legal state, status of the frequently asked questions. They are not guidance material, so there's sometimes a bit discussion whether, whether or not it has to be followed. Also, the justification behind some of those uh, answers to the questions would be appreciated. Some of the major classifications raised some discussion, and, uh, and we would appreciate if ESA could give the rationale behind those, that why they consider such and such a major or, or minor. Uh, and I think everyone agrees that even further standardization on, on how the TC basis is defined and, and, and as early as possible the level of involvement could be agreed upon. That this would improve the predictability of the design project as a whole. And, and uh, still we see a little bit uh, variation depending on which authority is handling the application. I'm talking about STCs now, now in general. So, so as, as much as standardization and, and, uh, and guidance material that can be produced in this area, I think this would benefit us all. But also we were told and, and we understand that the CMs and AMCs are, are in the process and they will improve this in the future. And then we received an interesting presentation from the ASA experts who were present in our side meeting concerning the RMP installation and how to flight test those and, and, and we appreciated the, the chance also to receive input from as an expert, not, not only bring topics of our own. We identified, lucky for us, only actions to ASA. <laughs> the first one is uh, specific to this rulemaking task force uh, 
689 to, to consider the gyroplane status. And I, I believe this information will go forward through our group leader. And, uh, and then we encourage to, to continue the development on, on the LOI definition, keeping in mind that, uh, that as early as possible as, as we can freeze the LOI, this helps the DOAs to plan the, the whole compliance activity. And, uh, and then please include as much rationale behind the answers to the FAQs as, as possible. We think, in general, the whole, whole concept of side meetings works well. We have an open atmosphere to discuss a little bit outside of the daily business and, and, it's, and everyone's projects, but uh, learn, learn from each other and ex exchange experiences, so, so thank you for that. And we appreciated the, the several experts being present in, in our meeting and, and bringing their comments to the discussion and also the, the fact that EASA was also bringing their experience on the table to, to be discussed. This was appreciated. Uh, issues are not necessarily issues, but, uh, but for the future, it, it would be beneficial if industry could agree commonly some, some topics prior to the meeting. We didn't go in, into details how this could take place, what, what would be the forum, where to, where to actually agree these topics, but, but we recognize that this would improve the, perhaps the quality of the, of the meeting and, and even more topics could be proposed. Well, now already we have some for the, for the next meeting here that uh, we, we would like to have some feedback on, on the OSD and I believe we are, we are getting some today, so, so that's uh, already good. And then, uh, even last year, there was an, uh, already discussion, and, and we would like to continue the discussion on the flight test campaigns where, where EASA is involved. So, where EASA experts and, and pilots are in the cockpit. What is the, the actual arrangement there? And, uh, and it has to do with the type ratings of, of test pilots and, and EASA experts, and how do we actually occupy the seats and, and cover all the requirements. Uh, and then we would appreciate some, some EASA experience and, and feedback, how, how it has worked out when, when the privileges to approve flight conditions and permit to flights have been now in, in active. So how, how has it worked? This was my presentation. Thank you for the side meeting and the You're a bit too fast. <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, a couple of questions on the slide. Sorry, Ala, I'm not that scary. Huh? <laughs> so thanks, Marcus. Um, so yes, we have at least one question on Slido, which uh, deserves a bit of uh, clarification. If I find it uh, back, where is it? Uh, yes. What is the applicability of the FAQ often quoted as a reference in presentation? Uh, FAQ are, are non-regulatory material. It is only uh, advice, uh, common practices, communication. It is a bit like our certification memo. We are very careful uh, with industry, and industry is very cautious with what we do in rulemaking, as you know very well. And there is one taboo, which is not to do rulemaking through projects or ongoing activities. This is really the worst offense we could make to the stakeholders and to the community. So we are very cautious here. So CERT memo and FAQs are a bit similar. They, it's a communication tool 
to let everyone know about the agency views, which are normally nothing which has not been already formally published. But we know our, uh, our system is quite complex, and we want to draw attention uh, more and more on some specific points, and that's why we may raise, when it is uh, quite a uh, solid topic, uh, complicated one, a certification memo to explain what our views are, which are only a way to share with you our best practices, or an FAQ just to let everybody know that for this very purpose, we have this already in place into our regulatory system, or developed through project and commonly shared with industry. So applicability, nothing mandatory, it is best practices, let's say. Good advice, good food, uh, food for thought, and normally, if you consider them, we should have an easy go through our communication with you. Okay, thanks Alain for that. Um, then we have the next side meeting group, which is the group of STCs that were supported by Rob and Daniel from, from our side, who's going to present for the STC group. This way. Two. Good morning. Welcome to the feedback from Group 6 STC side meeting. The side meeting provided a forum for debate and the sharing of DOA experiences over the past 12 months. Many topics were covered from the ever popular LOI to the rule, a request for a rule change to enable changes to ETSO parts at the part level rather than the aircraft level. This morning we'll share with you the highlights from the four main topics covered. Special conditions increase, LOI, OSD and AML STCs. Special conditions increase, industry and AASA were in agreement that as a minimum a list of, of crease and special conditions needs to be made available to industry as a DOA cannot know what, you comply, what to comply with if the information is not published. And it's only possible to ask for something if you know that it exists. <laughs> LOI, we were fortunate enough to have two participants of the early implementation program in our group who were able to share their experiences with us. Over the five projects, their experiences have generally been positive. However, they have found that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to the structure of CDIs, and they need to be determined on a project-by-project -project basis, although the AASA panels should be borne in mind when structuring these. There is a heavy upfront time investment in certification programs, with timescales increasing from two days to two weeks in some cases. Lots of early comms with AASA paid dividends later in the projects, with all five projects involved, uh, involved meetings at the start with AASA. The projects have all been conducted with an LOI focal point PCM, which has been beneficial. Outside of those projects, it was anecdotally reported by DOAs that the NAAs are less inclined to use LOI. From the AASA side of the house, it was highlighted that LOI is not intended to make the lives of DOAs any easier. It's about standardising the handling of changes and improving traceability. Both DOAs um, involved had focal point PCMs, but where you don't have one of these, your DOA team leader can assist in being a focal point for you. As the DOAs involved have found, CDIs need, um, CDIs need to be flexible so don't make your procedures too prescriptive. With regards to DOA performance, the specialists will be receiving further guidance and training on what this actually means, 
and what grades to be giving us. With particular regard to planning, where people have found they have been graded low because a project never runs to time. Keep it simple and keep AASA up to date. Thank you, Sasha. Um, yes, I've had to cover the last couple of items. The first one being operational suitability data. Um, I know it's been a bit of a hot topic, and we skirted around the issue quite a lot. Uh, we deviated quite a lot, and actually ended up with a really, really constructive um, discussion of which these are really the, the main points, as it were. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for independent DOAs is obtaining the original OSD data, which is um, produced by the, the type OEMs. Um, there are a couple of ways of approaching this. One was discussion with the ARSA. The other was looking at an arrangement with the TC holder. Um, that could be direct from the DOA, or it's probably better recommended going through the, uh, the um, aircraft operator, asking them to get hold of the OSD data as being probably the cheaper route. Um, the OEMs are sort of obligated to provide OSD data, but there's no obligation or what the degree of cost that would be, and historically that can be quite expensive. Um, there was a perception, particularly with CCD, as to how complex the CCD documents are, and perhaps that the DOAs are overthinking how complicated they are. And for instance, the Airbus CCD, I think it is for um, stowages, is actually very brief. Their, their CCD for some of the aircraft is only four or five pages long. And I think the perception is, or this came out of the meeting, that it's actually a much more complicated document. So recommended trying every avenue you can to get hold of the data. Um, yes, camos, particularly with flight crew data, and some of the differentiation between cabin crew data and crew operating manuals. And to realize there is a difference, a lot of the crew operating manuals aren't considered part of CCD. Um, but again, part of the responsibility of that is actually on the operator, not on the DOA, to ensure that your modifications are compliant, are sympathetic to the operation of the aircraft. So again, just highlighting there is a maybe a misconception of what the DOA's responsibility is and where the limits really stand for that. Um, yes, a, a reminder that if your if your approval say only covers CCD, you are still obligated to review all um, OSD requirements. Don't just limit your classification process to the, the, the areas where you have approval, because you could inadvertently affect something. So I think somebody mentioned um, flight simulators early, earlier as an issue. Um, and just one last thing on this issue. If the operator is not an EU operator, they do not need to comply with OSD. However, any modification given to an operator under an STC would have limitations. So you may be pressured by that operator not to include OSD or pay for it, but there are ramifications if that aircraft then returns into the European um, environment because any OSD requirements would then become valid. Um, it's just something to, to remember. We moved on to approved model lists. Um, and there was a, a couple of items around how do, you, how do you list them, what type of certificate do you use, which has already been mentioned. I think one of the important things that came out, and it was highlighted by the authorities, is that there are some modifications out there, and Garmin was uh, a manufacturer that was, um, was, was mentioned, that some of their mods in, on the AML do not provide full certification. So they will certify it as if it was effectively an ETSO item. And the onus on the DOA is to fill the gap. So just because it's approved by a third party doesn't absolve the DOA from completing the whole certification package. And I think it was indicated 
very vaguely that it's from the authorities' point of view, this is not an ideal situation. Um, so it's just something to be aware of, really. Um, yes, and there's a possibility in the future for major change privileges, which could serve as an alternative to AML. I can't remember the total details of that discussion, so talk to your surveyor about it. Um, what worked well? It was quite a big group in a quite a very long room, so it was very difficult to see people and stuff. It was, the agenda was particularly fluid. Um, unlike some of the other areas, we vetoed the, the idea of choosing the presenters at the beginning, and it was almost who was the last out of the room. Um, a lot of wide-ranging discussion, a lot of topics, very, very positive, so thank you very much, Robert, for um, facilitating that and for all the participants for, for the openness of the discussions. Um, and we covered everything that we set out to do, which was great. Um, as, yes, as a note, in the future, you only get out what you put in. Thoroughly recommend attendance at these, these meetings. So thank you very much. Oh, yes, the mug shots. I think one interesting thing through a number of groups was that OSD is such a hot topic and it's also shown by the poll that was run yesterday. So let's see how the discussion goes this afternoon. The next side meeting is for the ISM, the Independent System Monitoring. And I would like to thank Bülent and Francesco who supported the discussion in this group, and Patrick, you are doing the presentation? And Fabrice. So just to introduce the subject, so Patrick and I will share the presentation. And this subject is the interest of uh, everybody. We are all concerned by independent system monitoring. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so um, Fabrice Ross, um, the CEO of uh, Renar Consulting. Uh, sorry, it's Microsoft. So uh, it's not uh, under EASA control. So it doesn't work well. No, it's okay. No, it's my tablet. Okay. I just have to press next ah, okay. Button. It's very simple. Two Three buttons. buttons. Three. Oh, okay. Should I could manage that? I guess. Uh, okay. So uh, we are a company specialized in uh, setting up DOAs and also monitoring DOAs, external uh, CIM, uh, and I'm personally uh, CIM for three or four DOAs. Um, so I was naturally uh, part of this group, uh, and uh, I must say thank you, for Patrick, by the way, because he uh, he teach me the, the DOA and uh, the Part 21. So thank you, Patrick. Uh, Ten or 12, 12 years ago now. So uh, uh, thanks also f to all the team. So we were uh, 40 uh, 40 attendees uh, on the industry side, and thank you, of course, uh, uh, Bulent. Uh, who, uh, it was your first uh, DOA workshop, I guess. Uh, thank you also, uh, Francesco. And uh, of course, uh, thank you, uh, Bessel Van Vin, who came uh, uh, a few, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the number of, uh, number of the, the, who made a number of interventions, sorry, uh, during the meeting. Valuable, of course. Um, so, yeah. Um, Ah, okay. Animated. Okay. So first, uh, first, uh, thank you, Patrick. Ah, <laughs> all in one. 
Uh, so, uh, the main topics of discussion w uh, were about the ISM oversight at design some contractors, uh, it's a, which is a challenge for all of us because it represents a cost. Uh, ISM uh, in-house is already costly, but ISM uh, outside uh, represents a lot of cost, travels and, uh, and so on. Uh, we... Uh, oh, you changed the presentation, okay. Okay. Uh, so out of out of this uh, this um, uh, topic, uh, we reviewed the lessons learned uh, from the industry, and the key elements for a good monitoring and efficient monitoring of the suppliers. Uh, so of course, the contract uh, we we talked about the contract as the key entry point uh, to cover the the DOA need and the the the, uh, the, the contract uh, requirements. Uh, also, we, we discussed about uh, what is the kind of uh, uh, organization and uh, the, which kind of focal points should be, uh, should be put in place to have an efficient monitoring, uh, especially with subcontractors, but also sub-subcontractors sometimes. Uh, the contract, uh, no, the contract, sorry, the, uh, the interface should also define uh, the DOA deliverables, because without clear deliverables, we cannot monitor. We have nothing to, to look at. Uh, and of course, a good project management is necessary, and alignment of the project management between the uh, subcontractor and the DOA uh, is mandatory. And then uh, also, of course, the list of applicable procedures and tools. Huh? It's like in the DOP arrangement. Uh, when you work with a subcontractor, you need to define uh, what are the procedures which will be applicable and what are the tools, notably to exchange the, the data. And uh, of course, all that uh, should be summarized in a DO, uh, DO interface document, uh, setting, uh, setting the, the, its kind of uh, quality assurance plan, setting all the practical details uh, of the relationship with the subcontractor to ensure an efficient work. And this is the basis to, uh, to enable the independent monitoring to take place and, and a good uh, and efficient uh, surveillance to take place. And of course, enables the operational side. Then we, uh, we also discussed, a uh, second topic was about uh, how to ensure an efficient and uh, an effective um, ASM, so surveillance of, the, of uh, the, the DOA itself that time, and of course covering the subcontractors, huh? but not, not for all DOAs, but for small DOAs. Actually, it's a challenge. Huh? It's a challenge, and Patrick will explain you how we, uh, we propose to, uh, to solve that. So other topics uh, that were addressed during the, the workshop, were about uh, the corrective action and pre preventive, uh, uh, preventive uh, yeah, prevention of reoccurrences. Of course, it's preventive actions. So it's not enough to cure, uh, but uh, to fix the problem uh, uh, is, is, the, is the solution to prevent uh, uh, further findings. Uh, and at the end, uh, safety issues. What is the minimum to monitor, uh, the, the, to monitor while say, staying on the safe side? Uh, so, introduction of uh, innovation in the compliance uh, surveillance with proposal to define a risk-based approach. So, it's a concept that uh, we uh, already talked about yesterday, uh, as I talked yesterday. Uh, so, risk-based approach for setting up the level of surveillance. Then we also talked about the, the interest of uh, using the EN 9000 series where uh, the, uh, the, the auditing practices are already uh, more or less standardized. So we should base, uh, we should base our uh, surveillance on this kind of techniques and uh, especially root cause analysis and these kind of things that are maybe missing in the, in the current approach. Um, of course, we, we, uh, we discussed about uh, subcontractors, so we uh, investigated on how to delegate to the subcontractor the, the surveillance uh, on their side, and there are some, uh, some issues linked to that. And uh, at the end, uh, or more or less, the, nearly the end, the measurement of the DOA performance, so how to measure the DOA performance. So de measuring DOA performance is key because it's uh, a way to detect in advance and to do some preventive uh, 
preventive surveillance, detect in advance the potential issues that would be met uh, in the future and uh, prevent findings. Um, so, uh, and, and at the end, we compare the conformity to competence and conformity, uh, so addressing the ISM side, uh, how to select, uh, how to accept an auditor and an ISM and, and uh, the CIM. Uh, regarding uh, selection criteria of the company, which are in your um, uh, DOH, in your D1 book normally, whereas you may have some uh, auditors with a very good uh, level of competence, but which do not fulfill the criteria. So, uh, Patrick. Uh, Fabrice just forgot one significant item, which is the ISM skills and competence evaluation and maintenance, wide subjects concern of everybody. We took the decision at the AYCDS committee to establish it as a standard, and we have started the discussion on this subject. Now, what did work well? For the first time, we have seen a specific working group on independent system monitoring, so it's a very dynamic and positive first side meeting on independent system monitoring. We have to uh, highlight it. Uh, we were all DOA holders or advanced applicants, so we, sh we have shown that we are mastering properly the DOA requirements, despite the various sizes and complexity of our design organizations, for very different scope of approval. So the di diversity is a strength there. Uh, we have not discovered, it's not a novelty, we may have some uh, discussion, our discussion sometimes, but we are sharing the same level of understanding on ISM topics between industry, I mean people of the working group, and the EASA representative. Uh, what is important as well to know and to raise is that we were having newcomers from Asia, from Brazil, and they have appreciated uh, clearly the exchange as adding value to their knowledge and bringing some experience. And the discussion was uh, bringing new ideas, just quoting one, the targeted efficiencies, how to bring efficiency. I will not use the word cost efficiency, that was not pleasing, but indirectly for us, as CEOs of companies, we need to stay on the safe side while to be more performant. What are the issues that we have encountered? Uh, we have raised, identified the light one when the requirement is not always clear for everyone. When I mean everyone, both sides, industry and authorities. There is an acceptable means of compliance on the design assurance system, independent system monitoring. Coating the existing quality assurance could be used when the design organization is part of a larger organization. We do not all agree, and I personally not agree. Uh, you are not surprised, I guess. More guidance, sharing of best practices will be appreciated in a global way. Uh, we have also identified the auditor qualification, uh, raising the ISO 19011 is considered by most adding value in the practice, even if it's not coated in the guidance material of the 245. As action identified, uh, and I will push personally for it from the OSLS committee or from the DOA working group, but the group as industry proposed EASA further steps of working together towards the establishment of uh, ISM guidelines. I don't speak there about industry standards, no way. That could be available on the EASA website. We have identified that the words are always creating confusion so we would need some clarification in terms of uh, basic definition, just to, to quote one word, monitoring. For some of us, it's audits. For others, it's sample check. For others, it's simply surveillance. But we need to understand what is the task behind. So a word exists only if you define properly the task behind. Terminology, obviously. Uh, independent system monitoring, what means independent? It's not abuse for everyone. And clear tasks. So we are more concerned by the task than by the words. Uh, just before finishing, because I will not be there all afternoon, and I would like, on behalf of the 
European industry and non-European industry to thank EASA, uh, Marcus and Alain and all the team for the quality, I would say, of the workshop. And I would like on behalf of the group to thank uh, Francesco and Bulan for the, I would say, the excellence of their support as a moderator. I would like also to thank EASA for the possibility to be seen from the outside. Personally, on my own statistic, we have been visited more than 2,000 times since yesterday morning. And I know that, hello to everyone, my statistics are showing that people are checking us on the website from Toulouse, in the order of priority, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Ankara and Istanbul, Dubai, Bangalore and Moscow. I do not count here that because you are there in the, in the, in the room. So again, thank you very much. And uh, I do see all of us uh, next year for the same kind of subject. Thank you. Also, thanks for the nice words. Even though the workshop is not finished yet, we have more to come. <laughs> and with that, I would like to ask the last group, which was, I think, the biggest group, uh, to report back on change classifications, and it was supported by Chiro. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody. We will be quick because I think you are all expecting a coffee for the first break in the morning. So, we'll try to not to be too long. So, thanks first to uh, give us the opportunity to debrief the outcome of uh, Working Group 8 dealing on change classification. So, I'm Stefan Boussu and Mike will be the two speakers, which has been uh, nominated not at the beginning of the, of the session, not at the end, but just at the lunch break. So here, just a picture of a group, yes, we were one of the biggest uh, group, which was a, a challenge in itself, because here, at a, at a certain point of time, the more we are, the more it's difficult to have open discussion, but uh, as Mike will, will tell you, it was a good, uh, good outcome, nevertheless. So quickly, what was the main point of discussion and the action identified? The title was Change Classification of Change to Type Design, or Change to Type Certificate, sorry. The first issue before being able to classify the change, we have to agree, come back to the basic, what is a change? And there was one of the big topics, which was uh, what is a change of type certificate versus a concession or versus a non-intentional deviation from an approved design data? Or what are the differences between a production permit versus a change to type certificate. So it's a recurrent topic. We have various findings, uh, we have various uh, different point of view. So one of the outcome was uh, it's, uh, to ASA to consider to uh, rulemaking task and also in parallel to uh, think about recognition of some industry standards if they are accepted. There was on the, in the context of uh, ASD stand working group a standard which was initiated has been put on abeyance because there was a lot of uh, discussion or also a lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, with a different point of view also we shared with Vaza. so it's still an uh, ongoing subject and it's still a hot topic the second point so the role of a CVE of, of the office of RTNS for the identification of affected requirement again not directly linked to the classification, but the impact on the complexity of determination of a compliance demonstration is one of the criteria linked to the classification. So what we have to be sure, how do we identify properly this uh, affected requirement and uh, what does it mean in terms of signature, involvement, independent checking and so on. So we have this nice figure where we explain that basically we have a change against the type certification basis requirement. The type certification basis requirement is the reference we could find in the type, in the type certification data sheet. But it's global and it's for the full product. That when you are doing a change, in fact, you are just selecting uh, part of this requirement from the type certification basis. And this is the applicable requirement specific to the change. 
which links, it's not only the physical impact, it could be functional impact, but it's all the relevant requirement uh, applicable to, to the type of the change. But, and within this uh, set of applicable requirement, we adjust what we call the affected requirement, for which there will be a new demonstration of compliance. Sometimes you are making a change on cabin safety, you could make some uh, change. Cabin safety crash worthiness requirement is a systematic one. You need to consider it. All the change does not have the crash worthiness requirement as an affected requirement. So all for this kind of uh, type of requirement, we do not need to consider the integration of the uh, CV check to say that no, for this uh, kind of requirement, we do not need to have additional demonstration of compliance. Here it's uh, the assurance of the completeness of the requirement has to be ensured by just the Office of Worthiness, not by UCV. After that, on some small organization, the CV could pertain to the Office of Worthiness. But we have to be careful that in that case, it's not the role of the CV to declare that the requirement is not affected. So as an outcome on that, there was a lot, lot of discussion. There was no specific action. The current part 21 is adequate. And we discuss, we hear for your information, we cross reference some of the guidance material on 239A on the design assurance system uh, with regard to the role of the CV versus the role of Office of Awardiness. And the, it's me, huh? <laughs> yeah. and for the, the last point, uh, one of the last points on which we have a lot of discussion amongst other, but Mike, well, Mike will uh, give you the, the, the rest of the point to consider. Again, the role of CV Office of Artiness for the minor change to TC without additional work to demonstrate compliance. The famous minor, minor. And here, in fact, again, we had a lot of discussion, no action. Uh, but we consider that the current part 21 is adequate, uh, and we uh, ask you to consider uh, to have a look on the AMC 221A263C2, paragraph 232, which explains under which condition a minor minor change could be approved without having a direct signature of the Office of Awardiness. It's a possibility. Yes, it could be a delegated act of the Office of Awardiness, and a technical authority, an approver from the design office, could perform the classification and the approval of such a change. It's allowed by the Part 21. So that's why we end up in the conclusion that no action was uh, really needed. The current Part 21 is adequate. But uh, the, the key issue is that you need to be aware about, about it and use uh, about uh, this kind of interpretation. And some of our miscellaneous points, but I'll leave the floor to Mike for the final part of the presentation. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Mick Malone. I'm head of our wordiness at a company called Aero Inspection Part 21. We're a design organization holder based in the west of Ireland. Um, an update on the type cert data sheet, where the type cert holder performs non-significant modifications. The CS amendment status of these modifications is not always visible. Um, we would ask EASA if would it be possible to make these visible. On generic CRIs, I think we've already got a clap this morning on CRI issues. As my colleagues from the STC group said, if we don't know they're there and we don't know the EASA policy on them, it would be good to see that policy, please. On structures and cabins, there was a very good set of questions and an even better set of answers, and we thank our EASA colleagues for that. There's no further action required. Um, for the OSD, we leave it to the, oh, to the airlines group. I think it's been spoken about enough this morning. What worked well? Side meeting focusing on topics rather than DOA categories worked extremely well for us. With 30 plus people in the working group, that was quite a challenge, but there was a, a very, very good discussions. As Dilek said earlier this morning, what's my problem today will be your problem tomorrow or vice versa. And that led us to the networking, which was very good. We also got answers provided during the session, even if the answers weren't pre-recorded. -pre Some small problems encountered was the topic for selection wasn't shared until we got to the meeting. It would have been good to see it. No advanced distribution of the topics or the detailed questions. We, understood, we understand that this was done in previous years and that it was for the better. And we think it would be good if there was a detailed record of the side meetings to be held. That's it. Gurumila Mahagut, thank you very much.
you. Yeah. Thanks very much. And a big thanks for Chiro and Alex, who were our, our other moderators for this group. It was not uh, easy. And also thanks to the spe structure uh, specialist from VASA who come and share also the direct answer. It was highly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the groups of the side meetings to present their experience and the main topics. I think the overall result for me is that the structure of the side meetings works very well. It's much appreciated. It brings benefits to both you, industry, as well as us at EASA. So I'm pretty sure we will continue that. In the past, we had different side meeting groups. We will maybe arrange one or two of them, but in general, I think it works pretty well. Uh, we have some food for thought from some of the topics that you mentioned. Um, I personally am quite astonished by the amount of OSD questions and I'm looking forward for the discussion this afternoon. And with that I would say it's time for a well-deserved coffee break. Could you please be here in, let's say, 25 minutes for the next presentation? Thank you.